this morning, in light of our public professions of faith and the baptism, I wanted to preach on a text that I thought would be quite fitting for this occasion. And our text this morning is 2 Peter 3 and verse 18. But I'd like to set this verse a little bit in the context of Peter to give you an idea of what comes before it. So I'll read the entire chapter of 1 Peter 3, but our text is verse 18, the final verse. And so let's give our attention now to the reading of God's holy and errant and inspired word from 2 Peter chapter 3. This now, the second letter that, this is now the second letter that I am writing to you, beloved. In both of them, I am stirring up your sincere mind by way of reminder that you should remember the predictions of the holy prophets And the commandment of the Lord and Savior through your apostles, knowing this first of all, that scoffers will come in the last days with scoffing, following their own sinful desires. They will say, where is the promise of His coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all things are continuing as they were from the beginning of creation. For they deliberately overlook this fact, that the heavens existed long ago. And the earth was formed out of water and through water by the word of God. And that by means of these, the world that then existed was deluged with water and perished. But by the same word, the heavens and earth that now exist are stored up for fire, being kept until the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. But do not overlook this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years and a thousand years as one day. The Lord is not slow to fulfill His promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and then the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved, and the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed. Since all these things are thus to be dissolved, what sort of people ought you to be in lives of holiness and godliness? waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be set on fire and dissolved, and the heavenly bodies will melt as they burn. But according to His promise, we are waiting for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Therefore, beloved, since you are waiting for these, be diligent to be found by Him without spot or blemish and at peace, and count the patience of our Lord as salvation, just as our beloved brother Paul also wrote to you according to the wisdom given him, as he does in all his letters when he speaks in them of these matters. There are some things in them that are hard to understand, which the ignorant and unstable twist to their own destruction as they do the other Scriptures. You, therefore, beloved, knowing this beforehand, take care that you are not carried away with the error of lawless people and lose your own stability." But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To Him be the glory both now and to the day of eternity. Amen. Amen. May God bless uh, His Word to us this morning. Brothers and sisters in Christ and and friends today, uh, the last words of a person are important. The last words of a person are important, and they're very interesting to reflect on. Uh, So a few last words of famous people. Uh, Bob Marley's last words were, money can't buy life. Winston Churchill's last words were, I'm bored with it all. Uh, Even more Humorously, Oscar Wilde said, either that wallpaper goes or I do. Buddha's dying words were this, strive unceasingly. And what were Jesus' last words? It is finished. What a blessing to rest in the finished work of Christ by faith alone. Well, here are some of Peter's last words, close before he died. But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To Him be the glory both now and to the day of eternity. Amen. Peter's dying wish is that Christians would grow. That they would grow. 
In fact, it's an imperative. He says more literally, you must keep on growing. It's not optional, it's a command. It's expected of each of us as individual Christians and corporately as the church. Not to grow is disobedience. And so Peter's saying, keep on growing. Don't stop. But what kind of growth is this? Well, this is spiritual growth, not physical growth. It's spiritual maturity he's talking about here. And why do we need to grow spiritually? Well, because it's not good to remain immature. We need to grow up. It's, it's okay to be a baby Christian when we first believed But we need to mature in Christ, like infants need to mature into toddlers, right? They can't just be babies all their life. They're cute and we love them, but, you know, they need to grow up. And toddlers can't remain toddlers forever. They're cute again. They say the darndest things, right? But they're, they got to grow up. We don't want to see a teenager acting like a toddler. And teenagers need to grow up. They need to mature. They need to become adults. We know this. We know this naturally. And the same is true in the, the spiritual aspect of life. We need to grow spiritually. We need to mature in Christ. Now, in some areas of life, it's optional not to grow. You know, if someone says to you, you know, you really need to, you really need to grow in your basket weaving skills. Okay, well, that's optional, right? You don't really have to, and you probably won't care to grow in that area if it's not your hobby and passion in life. You know, if somebody, or if somebody says, you know, you need to, to grow in your video game skills. You might kind of say, well, okay, well, I kind of think that's a waste of time. I could probably do some better things in my time. And, uh, but what, what God's Word is telling you this morning is this. You really need to grow in Christian maturity, and we can't say no to that one. Uh, we can't say, I don't want to. You know, I remember the, the song growing up as a kid, I'm a Toys R Us kid. I don't want to grow up. I'm a Toys R Us kid. We can't have that attitude as Christians. We can't say, I think it's a waste of time. Uh, Christian maturity is needed growth. It's growth that is good for us. In fact, it's the most important kind of growth out of all the areas we might need to grow in. And it's the kind of growth that produces the fruit of joy and satisfaction. You won't regret it. You'll never say it was a waste of time. Spiritual growth in Christ is what we were made for and, cre and created for and saved for. It's the happy goal of our life as Christians. And so in what ways do we need to grow then? Well, according to God's Word here, we need to grow in at least three ways. First, we need to grow in grace. And we need to grow secondly in knowledge. And thirdly, we need to grow in glorifying Jesus. But first, notice with me that we need to grow in grace. In this letter, Peter teaches that the grace of God in Christ truly transforms and empowers Christians to live righteous lives even in the face of opposition. The grace of God truly transforms our lives. And he opens with this theme and, and he concludes with the same theme here. As Christians await the return of Jesus and the final day of judgment and salvation, he says, keep on growing in grace. But how are we to grow in grace? What does that even mean? Well, we could go a number of ways with this, but uh, there's several aspects of this that I'll, I'll highlight and mention. First, we need to grow in our understanding of grace. Grow in your understanding of grace. What is grace? What does that mean? Well, it's popular to describe grace as God's unmerited favor, and that's, that's true in part, but even more, grace is God's demerited favor, because you see, we deserve the opposite. It's not just that we get His favor and we didn't earn that favor, but we've actually earned the exact opposite. We deserve God's judgment that we heard about in this chapter. That's what we deserve if left to ourselves apart from God's grace and mercy in Christ. Yet God freely of sheer mercy and grace chooses to give us blessings. And it's all of grace. Children, it's like if you did something wrong and deserved to be punished by your parents. But your parents show you mercy by not punishing you and instead show you grace by giving you ice cream. Because your brother or sister took your punishment for you. Now, don't count on that. 
Often family life is a covenant of works, um, but in Christ we're in a covenant of grace. As someone once put it, grace, if you take each of the letters of the word grace, you can remember this simple definition, this memorable definition. Grace is God's riches at Christ's expense. Grace is God's riches at Christ's expense. <clears throat> and there are, uh, there's common grace blessings, uh, such as... Uh, uh, the blessings, the temporal blessings of a home, food, a job, sunshine, rain, the beauty of creation, books, movies, music, sports, and the list could go on. We can call those common grace blessings that you don't have to be a Christian to enjoy those. Those just wonderful gifts God gives to all people. But, but Peter has in mind here specifically saving grace blessings, eternal blessings, things having to do with salvation in Christ, forgiveness of sins, acceptance with God, Adoption as His children. The Holy Spirit's indwelling in the hope of an eternal inheritance. Peter is saying, grow in your understanding of these things. Be a student of all the saving benefits that flow from God the Father through Christ as a gift of grace to you who believe. Grow in your understanding of gracious salvation in Christ. And grow in your understanding that it's all of grace. It's a free gift. You don't earn it. You receive it as a gift through faith alone in Christ alone. You know, we can so easily fall back into a works righteousness mindset where we think that we earn our salvation or earn God's blessings by our works. But we have to always remember that it's amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. As Paul says in Ephesians 2, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. You may never boast in yourself for your salvation. You may only, and all we can do is boast in the Lord, Jesus Christ, and in God's grace. Titus 3 says, He saved us not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to His own mercy, so that being justified by His grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. And so know that salvation is all of grace. Know that God's grace never changes. Know that you don't begin in a covenant of grace only to fall back into a covenant of works. You are forever in the grip of God's relentless grace. No matter how much you sin. He forever loves you. He forever forgives you. He forever preserves you in His grace, in Christ. As my pastor friend put it, as a Christian, you should then think like this. I know that I've sinned a million different ways in my life. But God is gracious and He's forgiven my sins through Jesus. I know that I should be rightly condemned for all the wicked and terrible things that I've done. But I also know that God is gracious and that through Jesus He's forgiven my sins and justified me. And I know that even though I still stumble in sin and I'm far from perfect, God's grace holds me and preserves me. I mean, think of who is writing these words. Who wrote this letter? Peter, the apostle, who denied our Lord three times. If there's ever a wicked, terrible, grievous sin, that would be one of them, wouldn't it? To deny our Lord three times and to say, I never knew Him, and to curse yourself and call down judgment, to, to, to lie, to blaspheme, and to deny our Lord three times. If God can forgive Peter, He can forgive any one of us here. So keep growing in your understanding of God's grace to you. Know that it's all a grace from beginning to end as we'll sing through many dangers, toils, and snares, I have already come. Tis grace has brought me safe thus far, and grace will lead me home. But also grow in your experience of grace. What I mean by that is don't just know it in your mind. Truly rest in it. <clears throat> Soak it in. Rejoice in it. Pray about it. Proclaim it. Respond to it in gratitude. Taste and see that the Lord is good. And if you have tasted that the Lord is good, crave more of that goodness. Drink deeply of Christ by faith more and more. 
And how do we do that? How do we do that? Well, it's through the means of grace. It's through the means of grace. And what are the means of grace? Well, the means of grace are what are the word and sacraments. The word and sacraments, the Bible and the sacraments. The sacraments are what? They are visible signs and seals of God's promise of grace to us. And there's two of them that Christ has instituted, baptism and the Lord's Supper. In other words, what I'm saying is you can experience more of God's grace as you meditate on God's Word in private worship, in family worship, and in public worship. And as you remember your baptism, as you wake up each day and remember, I am baptized in the name of the Father and of the Holy and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, I belong to God by grace. And as you partake of the Lord's Supper by faith, you will experience God's grace by the Spirit as you partake by faith, which is the hand and mouth of the soul. You see, God has promised in His Word to ordinarily communicate His grace to us through the means of grace, through the Word and sacraments, and especially when that Word is preached And the sacraments are administered in public worship. And so diligently attend to the means of grace in order to grow in your understanding and your experience of God's grace in Christ. And third, grow in your exercise of grace. What do I mean by that? Well, the word for grace in the Bible also means gift, and it's often used to refer to spiritual gifts that God has graciously given us that are to be used for serving the body of Christ, the church. 1 Peter 4.10 says, As each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. Each of us needs to mature in this as well. We need to grow more and more in exercising our spiritual gifts in service of the body of Christ. We're to be good stewards of the gifts God's given us for His glory and the good of the church. And so let me ask you, are you using your gifts to serve the body of Christ in love? This is part of our calling and commitment as members of Redeemer. And we all need each other's gifts. What kind of gifts are there? Well, there's all kinds of gifts. And the the New Testament doesn't give us an exhaustive list, but a representative list of gifts. But you could summarize it in two kinds of gifts. There's word gifts and there's deed gifts. There's word gifts and there's deed gifts. Word gifts are those such as preaching and teaching and encouraging others with words, words of wisdom and counsel, words of prayer, words of comfort and affirmation, words of loving correction, words of guidance, words of hope in Christ. We all need these kinds of words from one another as we exercise our spiritual gifts. And there's also deed gifts. Deed gifts are those such as giving generously, to the gospel ministry and the needy, cleaning the church, doing the bookkeeping, recording sermons and posting them online, accompanying singing in worship, maintaining and improving our church building, hospitality, and the list could go on and on. And this doesn't always have to be something that is an official committee or service team in the church. Let me encourage you to exercise your gifts throughout the week towards all and especially towards your brothers and sisters in Christ, and especially in this church that He's called you to. And so keep growing in your understanding, in your experience, and exercise of God's grace. And then secondly, Peter says to grow in knowledge here. Grow in knowledge. Grow in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And this too has a couple aspects to it. First, Grow in your knowledge about Jesus, in His person and work. In other words, grow in your doctrinal knowledge. You know, sadly, we live in an anti-intellectual age in the Western world, and in particular, in the evangelical church. As historian Mark Knoll once wrote, the scandal of the evangelical mind is that there is not much of an evangelical mind. You know, a lot of Christians today are are sadly doctrinally shallow. They don't know much Bible doctrine. And this has been around for a while. Uh, Billy Sunday, an influential American evangelist and 
former professional baseball player in the early 20th century once proudly said, I don't know any more about theology than a jackrabbit knows about ping pong, but I'm on my way to glory. This is a sad and sinful attitude to have. This is the opposite of Peter's exhortation here. Uh, Peter exhorts us to grow in knowledge, which includes a knowledge of biblical doctrine. What is the great commandment that, that Jesus says? We're to love the Lord our God with all of our heart and with all of what? All of our mind. We're to love God with all of our mind. Are you loving God with all of your mind? Sadly, many want a personal relationship with God, but don't want to study theology. At best, they think it's a waste. At worst, they ridicule it. But wanting a a personal relationship with God apart from from studying theology is like a man who says, you know, he wants a relationship with a girl, but doesn't want to know anything about her. Imagine that. Your friend says that he really loves a girl, and you ask him, oh, what's she like? And he says, I don't know. (laughs) But you love her. Don't you know anything about her? No, that's not important. I just love her. But don't you want to know more about her? No, none of that would just kill the romance of the relationship. It would be just a bunch of head knowledge. I just want to be with her. I mean, do you see how silly that sounds? And why do we think that it's okay to have a relationship with God and not get to know Him better by studying theology? Theology is just the study of God. Getting to know more about God. Is that your attitude? Do you view the study of theology as boring and unimportant to your relationship with God? Well, turn from that attitude and way of thinking and love God with all your mind. Grow in the knowledge of God. Grow in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Now, granted, we all have different uh, gifts and capacities. There are different uh, levels of theological knowledge. I'm not saying that we all need to be PhDs in theologies, in theology. That's not what this is about. But we should all be growing in the knowledge of God as He's revealed Himself to us in the person work of Jesus Christ. The Heidelberg Catechism and the Westminster Shorter Catechism are a great place to start. And there are simple theological books like Everyone's a Theologian by R.C. Sproul and Concise Theology by J.I. Packer and Core Christianity by Michael Horton that I'd recommend, and I encourage you to pick up a, a, a theological work this, this year and read it. Is that on your New Year's resolutions? You who have, you know, come up with all these books you're going to read this year, you got a theological book on there? Add one. And uh, if you've read those books I just mentioned and you need a, a recommendation, I'm always ready to recommend a good theological book, and I'll, I'll try really hard only to recommend one or two and not like 10 or 15 because I can easily get away, you know, get carried away there. But let me encourage you to grow in the knowledge, in doctrinal knowledge of Jesus Christ and of God. Again, the point is that we should all be striving with the variety of gifts and capacities and resources we have to grow in in this way. This is how we remain strong as God's people against false teachers. Did you catch what comes right before this exhortation in verse 17? Peter puts it right before this in verse 17. Notice, take care that you are not carried away with the error. You see that? Take care that you are not carried away with the error. Notice he doesn't mention the behavior of lawless people, but the error of lawless people. And lose your own stability. Theological error is dangerous. Therefore, grow in true theological knowledge. Take up your Bibles and read them and and grow in theological knowledge, and and grow in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. But but while we need to avoid anti-intellectualism, we also need to avoid the opposite extreme, what we might call a hyper-intellectualism. In some circles, even uh, Reformed circles, knowledge can sometimes be overemphasized, where it's just knowledge and doctrine all the time and nothing else. And perhaps you've seen this. Perhaps you've struggled with this yourself. On this extreme side of things, people know sound theology. They they always talk about it. They constantly correct bad doctrine, sometimes even in a nitpicky way. Uh, They know sound doctrine up and down, and they're quite proud about it. It's like when Paul said that knowledge puffs up. 
But for these kind of people who are hyper-intellectual, it's only doctrine all the time for them as they, as they look down their doctrinal noses at everyone else and they aren't so concerned about Christian living and Christian love. And John Newton, the author of Amazing Grace, said, self-righteousness can feed upon doctrines as well as upon works. And a man may have the heart of a Pharisee while his head is full of correct views of sin and grace. Maybe you've been there yourself. Turn from that. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 13, and and if I understand all mysteries and all knowledge, but have not love, I am nothing. I am nothing. And so we don't want to fall into that side of things either. We want to grow in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And part of growing in our knowledge is growing in His teachings on love and humility and putting them into practice. When we truly know Christ and what He taught and what He did for us to save us miserable sinners, we can't be proud and unloving. We can only be humble and thankful and loving. And this knowledge that Peter is talking about is more than knowledge about Jesus and sound doctrine concerning Him. It includes that. But it's also a personal knowledge of Jesus. As we saw in Colossians 2, which we considered last time we had public professions of faith, we asked the question, how did you begin the Christian life? And we saw there that when you began the Christian life, you received a person. You received Jesus. You believed in Him. You trusted in Him. Yes, you received the truth about Christ. You learn the correct doctrine of Christ, as important as that is, but let us never forget that a person saved us. We were redeemed by a real flesh and blood person. And so too, do we continue in a personal relationship with Jesus? We listen to His voice in His Word. We have a growing experience of the goodness of our Good Shepherd and the tenderness of His love and the greatness of His wisdom and we speak to Him in prayer and we tell Him that we love Him and we trust Him. We spend time with Him as we spend time with a good friend or a spouse that we love. Do you know Jesus personally? Do you know the sweetness of His love? Do you know the strength of His Word? Do you know the comfort of His grace? Do you know the wisdom of His ways? Do you know our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ? If not, you can know Him this day. How can you know Him this day? Well, come to Him now. Come to Him now by faith. Trust in Him. He is freely offered to you as Savior and Lord this day. If you are sorrowful for your sins and confess to God that you are a sinner and deserve His judgment, and if you call upon Christ alone for salvation, trusting in His perfect obedience for you, His death on the cross where He bore God's wrath in your place and His resurrection from the dead, then you will know Him as your Savior, and He will come to dwell within you by His Holy Spirit. If you trust in Him and in His work for you, you, then you will be saved. You will know Jesus as your Savior. Not just the Savior of others, but as your Savior. And you can know Him as Lord as you continue to follow Him and submit to Him and obey Him as your new Master who loves you and redeemed you with His precious blood. Know Him this day. Don't put it off until tomorrow. You never know what may happen. And if you put it off and you die first, if you put it off and you die first, you will never know Him as Savior, but only as your judge forever. So come to Jesus now and know Him today as your Savior and Lord. And if you already know Him as your Savior and Lord, continue to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Keep studying Him as He's revealed in God's Word, especially the Gospels. Keep spending time with Him in the Word and in prayer. And know that if you've drifted from Him, He's always near. Return to Him. Return to Him this day and know that He will forgive you and never leave you nor forsake you. And He who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion 
at the return of Christ, you will by the Spirit who dwells in you grow in Christ. And so this knowledge of Jesus is head knowledge, but it's also heart knowledge. It's a relationship that involves our heads, our hearts, and even our hands and feet as we follow Jesus and walk in His footsteps of love for God and others. And so grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And third, grow in glorifying Jesus. Peter's concluding words are, to Him be the glory, both now and to the day of eternity. Now, to whom is Peter referring here? This is a doxology, which is just a fancy way of saying that it's a a word of, uh, of prayer, of praise for God. And doxologies are always directed to God. But Peter just finished mentioning Jesus, notice, and growing in our knowledge of Him. And so how can he put Jesus here? Well, the simple answer is that Jesus is God. He's God the Son, the second person of the Trinity. And this is another one of the many proof texts in the Bible that shows that Jesus is God. And He is worthy of our worship and praise. God reveals in His Word that He is one in essence and three in persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And so as we grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus, we praise Jesus. We worship Him and bow down, bow down to Him who loved us and gave Himself for us. As we'll, we, we sing with the, the saints in heaven, worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive blessing and honor and praise and thanksgiving. And this is what we were created for. Uh, the Westminster Shorter Catechism asks, what is the chief end of man? What a wonderful question to think about. What is the chief end of man? What is the goal and purpose of our life? Why are we here? What is man's chief end? And the answer is to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. And with Peter's words here, we could replace that and say that man's chief end is to glorify Jesus and to enjoy Jesus forever. And we could say that about God the Father and God the Spirit as we have fellowship with each of the three members of the Trinity. We glorify and enjoy each of them. In the words of the Athanasian Creed, we worship one God in Trinity and the Trinity in unity. But this is what we were made for. Augustine, St. Augustine once said, you have made us for yourself, O God, and all our hearts are restless until they find their rest in you. John Piper said that God is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied in Him. These things go hand in hand. We were made for this. This will bring us true joy and satisfaction to live for the glory of God. And we glorify and enjoy Christ now in part as we grow in the grace and knowledge of Christ. But what we know in part now, we will know fully when Christ returns. And then we will glorify and enjoy Him perfectly and for all of eternity. As Peter says, To Him be the glory both now and to the day of eternity. That's like what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 13. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I have been fully known. You see, the age to come will be far more glorious than this age. Whatever we know now is only partial knowledge. Even the best theologians in history have only a partial knowledge of God. But then our theology will be perfected. Now it's a theology of pilgrims on the way. But then it will be a theology of the blessed who have arrived in glory. And so whatever experience of the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior of Jesus Christ that we have now and joyfully praise Him because of it, it will be far more glorious on that day and one of inexpressible joy. Now we walk by faith, but then we'll walk by sight. We will see Jesus face to face and be like Him in glory. And it will be so amazing that we can hardly imagine it now, but we will long for it more and more as we press on in the Christian life. As I've said before, knowing Christ in this age, it's kind of like an amuse-bouche. Now, you may be wondering, what in the world is an amuse-bouche? Is that some kind of French word? Well, it's a, it's a single bite-sized hors d'oeuvre 
that's, that's not on the menu at a restaurant and is usually found at a really, really nice restaurant. And you don't order it. The chef just sends it to your table to just whet your appetite and give you a, a taste of, of his skills and, and what's to come. You know, one time my, my wife and I experienced this on one occasion of our, one of our anniversaries when we went to a, a nice restaurant and the waitress could tell we weren't regulars <laughs> when we said, uh, um, what, is, what is this? We, we didn't order this, you know, I'm, I'm cheap, I don't want to pay for something I didn't order. But then she explained to us what it was, so we ate it, and it was so good. Definitely better than any Costco sample we've ever had when they used to have them. And because it was only one bite, and it was so good, we, we craved more. We couldn't wait for the full meal. And in a similar way, God spreads a, a spiritual feast for us every time the Word is preached and the sacraments are administered. And He greatly nourishes our souls by His Word and Spirit when we partake by faith. But it's just a foretaste of what's to come at the full meal, at the wedding supper of the Lamb, when Christ returns, where we will no longer walk by faith, but we'll walk by sight. And for all of eternity, we will joyfully proclaim of Jesus, to Him be the glory, and to the Father, and to the Spirit, one God, forever and ever. And so to you young people who are publicly professing faith today, and to all those who, who know Christ and profess Him as Savior and Lord this day, let me leave you with these words again, the last words of the Apostle Peter, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, to Him be the glory both now and to the day of eternity. Amen. Let's pray. <clears throat> Our gracious Heavenly Father, we, we thank You for Your saving grace and mercy to us in Jesus Christ. And Father, we, we pray that You would uh, forgive us for not loving You with all our minds, with all our heart, with all our soul and strength. And we thank You that there is always abounding grace, superabounding grace in Christ. And we, we rest in that. Help each of us to, to rest in that, to soak it in, to, to rejoice in it, to truly experience it this day. And may it transform our lives. We want to live lives of gratitude. We want to walk by the Spirit. And we know that apart from Jesus, we can do nothing as He said. But as we abide in Him, we will bear much fruit. And so we pray that Your Holy Spirit, who dwells within us, would would grow us and mature us in the image of Christ and cause us to bear the fruit of the Spirit, the fruit of love and joy and peace and patience and gentleness and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and self-control and humility and, and all the other fruit of the Spirit. We long for that more and more, that we would bear that in our lives for Your glory and that we would so glorify and enjoy You, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, as we press on in the Christian life, looking forward to that day of glory when Christ returns. We pray, Lord Jesus, quickly come. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.